um, one of the poems that, that nobody quite knew what to make would make of the slam in uh, Chicago. It's called uh, Skinhead. <laughs> they call me Skinhead, and I got my own beauty. It's carved across my back in sore, jagged letters. It isn't the way my eyes snap away from the obvious. I sit in my dim matchbox on the edge of a bed, tousled with my ragged smell, slide razors across my hair, count how many ways I can bring blood closer to the surface of my skin. These are the duties of the righteous, the ways of the anointed. The face that moves in my mirror is huge and pockmarked, scraped pink and brilliant, apple cheeks. I'm filled with my own spit. Two years ago, a machine that slices leather sucked in my hand and held it, whacking off three fingers at the root. I didn't feel nothing until I looked down and saw them on the floor next to my boot heel, and I ain't worse since then. I sit here and watch niggers take over my TV set, walking like kings up and down the sidewalks in my head, walking like their fat black mamas name them freedom. I know that's not right. So I move out into the sun, where my beauty makes them lower their heads, or into the night with a lead pipe shoved up my sleeve, a razor down deep in my boot. I was born to make things right. It's easy now to bend my big body into shadows, coming from a place where there was nothing into the stark circle of a streetlight, the pipe raised over my head. It's a kick to watch their eyes get big, round and gleaming like cartoon jungle boys, in the second before they know the pipe's gonna come down, and they got this thing I like to say, listen to this, I say, nigger, Ed Lincoln's been dead a long time. My dick gets hard listening to the skin burst. I was born to make things right. Then, then some newspaper finds me. You know, it seems I was a little sloppy kicking some fags ass in the South End, and they finally curl up in my bed, the TV flashes licking my face clean. Same old shit. No, I ain't got no job. Affirmative action, the color to the fix got them. Why ain't I working? Look at my hand, asshole. No, I'm not part of any organized group. I'm just a white boy who loves his race, fighting for a pure country. Sometimes it's just me, sometimes three, sometimes 30. AIDS will take care of the sissies, then it's gonna be white on black in the street, then there'll be three million. I tell him that. So he writes it up. And I come off looking like I'm some kind of freak, like I'm Hitler himself. I'm not that lucky, but I got my own beauty. It's in my steel-toed boots, in the hard corners of my shaved head. I look in the mirror and hold up my mangled hand, only the baby finger left sticking straight up. I know it's the wrong goddamn finger, but fuck them all anyway. I'm riding the top rung of the perfect race, my face scraped pink and brilliant. I'm your baby, America, your boy. Drunk on my own spit, I am goddamn fucking beautiful. And I was born and raised right here. Um, this is this is a found a found poem. I, I did not write this. Um, I saw there was a novel on the shelf one day and it had a weird cover to it, so I turned it over to see what it was about. And this is exactly what it says. The title of the book was As Far As Blood Goes. As Far As Blood Goes is a biographical novel that chronicles the efforts of a talented, unhappy black youngster to escape slavery and become a physician, as is his natural white father. Though the hero, Michael Mabaya, is fictional, his accomplishments parallel those of hundreds of now forgotten black men and women who overcame the crushing barriers of their times to lead lives of quiet achievement and dignity. Michael Mabaya's story is the stuff of great fiction, for after he achieves his goal and becomes a respected physician, he draws attention to himself by reading a controversial paper at a medical convention. The result? He is taken back to Virginia to be sold as a common slave. His only hope is that his father acknowledges him at last and that his white brother will come to his rescue. Mm -hmm.
Such a proper oatmeal. Three, two, one. Once again, she poured her pupils tight into the camera. I see Rick. I see Kathy. I see David. I see Michael. She didn't see shit. She never did see anything. But they demanded the creation of box top children, of toddlers with inquisitive blue ovals, with A's and B's and C's marching in uniform stupidity down their throats. She sensed rebellion in the soaks of their hair. She smelled something crazy in the pale, sinewy skin at their necks. She could hear their hearts beating telltale rhythm. A, B, C, D, E, F. Fuck. If only she could pull their glittery sing-song voices away from her face. If only her thighs didn't lean forward at night, remembering their sputter talk, their 60, 70 snaking fingers. If only she didn't always break just short of the stoplight, terrorized by primary colors. <laughs> Never wanting to reach home, where her nights were indelibly haunted by the farmer in the fucking dell, and her screams were shaped like the heads of children. I'm trying my best to read stuff that I haven't been reading, like all over Boston. Um, this was a few years ago. There was a case where a woman burst into a California courtroom and shot the man who was about to go on trial for raping her eight-year-old daughter. Shot and killed him in the courtroom. And yeah, hey, hey. At first, she tried doing what they told her to do put her pain in the Lord's hands. But the Lord wasn't playing that. He hurled it right back at her, too damned busy that day for her brand of sorrow. So she prayed until her knees screamed. She prayed until her throat ached with praying. She prayed over the walking ghost with her daughter's name. And at each amen, she touched the child's quivering cheek with the back of her hand. And finally, she called the Lord son of a bitch. It was then she realized how late it really was. How the very passage of time had slapped her silly. So she dressed carefully. Thick, dark fabrics. Shoes with soles of rubber. A woolen scarf in deep hues of blue. No jewelry. A petticoat. And they led him in, chained at the wrist, reeking of what he had taken. Her daughter's her daughter rained down hard upon his shoulders, her pleas still singing in his ears, his eyes moving like any other eyes, his feet pointing forward and holding his weight like any other feet, and the air around him all wrong, his smile rising up dark and slapping. Lord, I've just about had it, she whispered. I'll blow this pain sky high. I'll send it back to you in pieces. After that, it wasn't hard. It wasn't hard at all for her to end what he held in his eyes with what she held in her hands. <laughs> 